Welcome to Paintbrush and Ivories, the podcast for artists and curious creatives that connects creativity with the heart and soul. I'm Michelle Walker and I'm here with my creative soul sister, Jennifer Ruth Russell. Hi, Jen. Hey, Michelle. Are you ready? Are you ready to rock and roll? I am. Thank you for that little (laughs) jazzy intro that you did just before we jumped on. I'm feeling (laughs) excited. So today we're going to talk about wanting to be an author, or maybe you don't want to be an author, maybe you're just curious about the whole writing process as part of our creative toolkit, if you like. So that's what we want to chat about. Jennifer, tell me, you've written at least three books that I know of. Tell me a bit about your writing experience and your writing history. I'm so glad we're talking about this today because you are an author and I'm an author as well. And The way we've authored books is a completely different way. And I think it's going to be wonderful for this juicy conversation to just let people know there's really not one way to do this. There's a plethora of ways to be an author. If I didn't even know I wanted to be an author. (laughs) (laughs) Nor did I actually. Go on. (laughs) Yeah. So the way I became an author was, I don't want to say by accident, but it was, um, Well, I guess I'll tell the story. Are we, are we, do we have space to tell a story here? I I guess we do. I think we do. I think that's what it's for. Go. (laughs) So I was doing a mini course, a 21 day course on the flow of financial freedom. And I was doing it with mother Mary, just as you know, as she was going to be the high arc, the beautiful and angel that was watching over the whole thing. And about a week before I was doing research and I heard very clearly Jennifer, I want to do this course. I want to write a book through you. I want to do a message every day for 21 days. And that is going to be the text for this course. And it's going to become a book. (laughs) So I was like, flying by the seat of my pants. Like, how is this going to work? And it literally feels to me like being on the highest wave you can imagine on a surf bar, not knowing when that wave is going to crash or burn. It's just an exhilarating ride. That's how it feels when I write a book. Yeah. I'm in the process of writing another book right now. So it, it's a, a wonderful place to be. And it's also, it takes deep trust for me to write a book. Mm. It takes that place of, of really letting go of my little self and what I think about myself. <laughs> my own opinion, let's say, of myself has to really be put in the right place. How about you, Michelle? I know you have a beautiful book. And I, uh, why don't you tell us about your experience of becoming an author? Well, it's interesting because I wrote a book for my consulting business probably about three years, two years before I wrote 20,000 Brushstrokes. So the first book I wrote and published was a manual, a support guide, a technical book for people who were interested in the field that I was specializing in, which was called Graphic Facilitation. And it was a very creative take on that. But that didn't really set me up for the journey that was 20,000 Brushstrokes. And I, I have to be honest, I don't know if I told this, have told this story on an earlier episode. So folks, if I've given this little blurb, please forgive me. But my becoming an author was also a bit of a, I'm going to say an accident, but wasn't something that I had pre-planned at all. I went to a business breakfast. I won the Lucky Door Prize. The prize was a book by a young woman. I say young, she was 29. So she was, you know, a good 15 years younger than me. And she'd already already authored nine books, which I was quietly just a little in awe of. And her book that I'd won was this title called, you know, Finding Your Inspiration, something like that. And it was lovely because I went up to her afterwards and said, thank you so much. I'm very grateful to win this prize. And she said to me, like a good writing coach would, she said, so have you got a book in you? And I spoke before I thought, which was really interesting because it was a very core kind of belly sort of response. And I said, I think I've got two. I've got the one that tells the story of growing up very closely associated with the court system in Queensland where I grew up because of my parents' divorce and all the custody wrangling. And there's another one which tells what I think I've learned about life and what I think is important in life, which I saw as being more of a a resource for my coaching clients. And in that moment, she looked at me and she said, they're probably one and the same book. And I had such a physiological Mm -hmm. recognition of the truth. 
Mm-hmm. And I left that breakfast and I drove and I had about, uh, I don't know, an hour or two before I was meeting someone for work. So I had this space of time. And honestly, the whole drive from when I left the breakfast to where I was going to the next meeting, I had about an hour in the car. Every time I thought about this book, this thing, I just filled up, not with tears of apprehension, but just that constant recognition of a truth that was so Mm -hmm. true, I couldn't ignore it. And I went and sat and wrote. And what I found was when I was sitting waiting for my next meeting, I actually discovered all these snippets of writing that I'd done in the previous year or two. And I also recognized that I, I'd lost both my parents that were in the previous 18 months. And when I was sitting there thinking about this book and the story that I needed to tell, which if I was to be true to myself, could only be told after their passing. They could not have been walking around mm-hmm. on this planet and me write the book that I needed to write. And so that was the genesis of it. And it really was something that had its own momentum. It had its own beingness almost. It was quite tangible. And I found that really a very unique experience, totally different. The, the technical book I'd written previously was just, it was just that, you know, it was, I know this stuff and I kind of offloaded some content out of my cerebral cortex onto a page. But 20,000 Brushstrokes was a totally different journey and a totally different birthing, if you like. Mm. I'm interested in in talking to you about your writing process because I know, Jen, that your writing process is dictated by your spiritual process aligned with the work that you do. So tell me a bit more about how do you actually physically write the book? What form does it take? How does it flow for you? Mm. Well, you know, the first thing I want to say before I answer that question is I so appreciate what you said about your call to be an author, because I think so much of the time, a book, just like a CD, just like a piece of of artwork is an exposure. It takes you out of your comfort zone. It makes you grow. It It absolutely puts your all your insecurities on notice. <laughs> like, okay, you think you're going to do this? Uh, are you sure you can do this? I mean, all, all that has been my, my experience anyway. So I think that's probably one of the reasons that for me to do a, a process in a period of time with a group of people is really helpful for me in my creative process. So Right now, I would say the Angels of Abundance Ascension Academy is a beautiful, alive book that we are experiencing together as it comes alive, you know, Mm -hmm. as it comes alive. So my writing process is to get really still and to have a conversation with Mother Mary, who I believe is a higher part of myself. And yes, she is a representative of the Divine Mother. And sometimes I'm so surprised by things that come through. And sometimes I'm like, wow, this is something that I've known for a really long time. And it's just coming forward in a different manner. So I absolutely just sit in the stillness and calibrate, connect and receive a message. And it, it is a beautiful process. I really like it. It's part of my, as you said before, it's part of my spiritual practice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I really believe this higher part of myself that I call Mother Mary, who is, I believe, Mother Mary, is also my mentor. So she gives me instructions for myself. A lot of those never make the book. So I have kind of like my own personal (laughs) text that is continuing on. And then I know when it's something that is to be shared. And a lot of the morning light meditations come around that way as well. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's one one of the things that surprised me was I didn't really experience a lot of anxiety or doubt when I was writing the book so the book took me almost exactly 12 months to write and I had one wobble and it wasn't really a wobble it was just the thought that occurred to me about six months five months in oh I'm not really progressing it to the speed not not so much the speed but I just didn't really feel the momentum and I possibly didn't feel the connection. And what I agreed with myself was I would spend 20 minutes every single day in the morning before I did much else. I just spent 20 minutes and some days I spent 15 just rereading a couple of paragraphs and changing some punctuation. It wasn't any big deal. But sometimes that 20 minutes became three hours. I got in the flow or I might get a really solid hour in 
when I made that commitment to myself and to the project, everything changed. I think I wrote about 75% of the book in that last six months, but it felt great because I felt like I had continual connection with the project and the and the ideas were right there. It was really easy to just slip back in and find my rhythm. So I didn't feel like I ever got very disconnected from it. And that really helped the momentum. And, and that's something that I've used as a technique I've used in other projects that I find has been a good learning from me, regardless of whether I'm writing a book or doing some whole other thing, is just this small bite size connection time every day. Julie Cameron's The Artist's Way, which is an incredibly beautiful book and it's been written many, many years ago. But that idea of the morning pages, it almost, the book Mm -hmm. became almost like my morning pages. One of the crucial things I chose not to do was if I was writing, I would just let myself write. I wouldn't edit. I wouldn't fuss around with the minutiae of punctuation sort of idea. I would just let it flow. I would just tell the story through my fingers and I was mostly writing it on my iPad. So I had Mm -hmm. that. So yeah, the connection was really important and that really helped because it's it was quite a big tome. It could have been eight separate books, you know, if I wanted to write little yes. books, but it's quite a big body of work. It is. It is a beautiful body of work. And I, I remember at a, at a certain point too, because I was with you during that process, that there was um, there was something that needed to be said that you were not bringing forth and it really like kept knocking or, or as Ricky Byers would say, tapping on my head, kept tapping on you like, you got to pay attention. I'm supposed to be in the book. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's yeah. right. So what was driving that was I'd actually written an outline. So as a process, I got some help. I used a, a writing coach who happened to be the woman who wrote the books that I won at the breakfast. So Emily was a great writing coach and we had a session where we came together. I'd sent her a whole lot of ideas that I was thinking of. And she just helped me massage them into seven chapters. And then she asked me enough questions that I came up with some, an idea of how I could structure each chapter so that each had, each of them looked the same. So there was a sort of an intro story and, and then there was some other stories from other people. And then mm-hmm. there was some distilled wisdoms that came out and then creative activity and then a meditation. And I found a poem for the beginning page and I found a mantra or kind of a invocation for the last page of the chapters. So every chapter had the same sort of structure. And that was fantastic to have. It was almost like the riverbanks. I don't want to use a riverbank analogy right now because having just come through floods, it's not. (laughs) Bookends. It's it's not so true. But yeah, just the the bookends of where Mm. I could go and and that also helped my my writing process was I just felt like I could pour content into that structure and it would work and it really did and I I think that's where my stubbornness about you know the sort of unspeakables and the unforgivables which that which was actually the the eighth chapter you know demanded to be written and so I ended up going there in the end but I was it was this sort of both the the helpfulness of the structure and then ultimately having to to revise it to make it work and that as a as a way of going through it the outline was critical and it wasn't a dry outline I think that's the other thing is what was a secret for me was once I'd done the outline I got so excited like I really that was the beginning of actually really seeing a book emerging was when I realized that yeah this is this was a totally doable arc of creativity and I could just take it to its nth degree But the wobble that I had at about five months in was I chose to tell people that I was writing a book and I used to call it my, my shorthand reference to it was it's part memoir, part manifesto, which I still think works really well as a description for the book. Hmm. But having said that to friends and, you know, given it voice, I then got five months in and thought, maybe this is never going to happen. And then I really confronted this idea that I could fail. I could be a failure. Like I could think I'm going to be an author. I could really feel like I'm going to be an author. And what was interesting about that was it was an echo of my journey with fertility. This thing of feeling so from a deep core part of me motivated to 
engage in this adventure, you know, this creative journey and feeling so moved to do so that it's totally 100% right to do it and then get to a point where actually maybe it's not going to work out. And once I recognised the echo and that that actually didn't necessarily have to apply, I got underway and that's when I got the wisdom about doing just 20 minutes a day every day, just keep keep your fingers on it and yes. that worked perfectly. Beautiful. So interesting what kind of demons or gremlins come up when we yeah. do the embarking down a path we've never done before. Yeah, I know. I, I noticed that I put, you know, my process is kind of putting things out there that I markers in front of me that I have to reach because I've involved other people. <laughs> You know, like I asked you to do the covers for me. Yes. I asked my friend Elizabeth to set up the, the artwork for me. I asked beautiful Julena to, to edit for me because mm -hmm. I'm not great at, at that. And I really needed somebody to help me with that. So by the time she gets it, it's gone through about maybe three different times of me tweaking it and getting it right. I guess that's when you do anything creative. Just if you're painting a picture, mm -hmm. if you're writing a song, it, you know, those little gremlins come up and, and just ask you once again, are you going to be moving forward? And I, I just want to say this to everybody that's listening. It's really important to keep moving forward. <laughs> Don't listen to them. All right. Well, I, as I said before, I think of my gremlins as all standing up, lined in a queue for the outhouse and they're wearing little shower caps. And I just say, thanks for sharing, get in the back, back of the bus. You know, I'm yeah. not really, I know they're going to be there. I just say, Hey, I see you. I hear what you're trying to do to me, but I'm not, I'm not yeah. going for it. And I think and then, that's a skill that we all need to build. I will say it's like anything that we're learning. You need to just do it over and over again. Mm. Just realizing who cares? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Who cares yeah. what you're saying? Really? I, it's, it's, I'm here to do this. I know that I need to do this. So I got a great quote. I love this book, Bird by Bird, which is Anne Lamont. She's a writer and she, and that book is about writing and life. Her wisdom around this, because this was one of the books I read while I was in my writing phase. I read a couple of books around writing. She says, to be a good writer, you not only have to write a good deal, but you have to care. And I love this. You do not have to have a complicated moral philosophy, but a writer always tries, I think, to be part of the solution, mm -hmm. to understand a little about life and to pass it on. And I thought, that's it. That's my thing. You know, that was what I was trying to do was not to try and elevate myself to be some all-knowing wise guru, but it was this thing of I've, I've experienced this and this is what I've learned and just you know, pass it on to one other person and for it to make a positive impact was enough. Mm. And I had my convictions really tested because I was in a writing community group where we would share, you know, what we're doing and challenges and where we were having wins, etc. And this other writer reached out to me and said, you're writing a memoir. And I said, sort of, you know, <laughs> it's kind of sort of a memoir, but sort of not. And she said, oh, she said, I got told by this very knowledgeable person that you would never write a memoir unless you were an incredibly well-known celebrity, mm. movie star, you know, personality. And this person that was saying it to me had really seriously questioned what she was doing. And she had an incredibly important story to tell. And I said, don't listen to that. That's not for you. I said, do you still feel really driven to tell your story? And she said, yes. And I said, then that's all that matters. Mm -hmm. And I was sort of talking to myself as well, but I realized that I wasn't bothered by someone else's, you know, criteria that we have to go through in order to, it's like, no, this is the joy of self-publishing. This is the joy of being in life as we know it in the world, being able to access all sorts of technology that we can write our story and share our story. Absolutely. And if we feel Absolutely. motivated in our heart to do so, awesome. Yeah. Go do yeah. it. Write I your think, story. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think it's really important. I think it's very cathartic for most of us, you know, to write our story and to, to get it out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, definitely. And our stories have, they have beauty in them. And I do think it's, for me, it was great. I don't know if it was cathartic because I'd done a heap of clearing of stuff before I got to tell those individual chapters. And the chapters that I chose were, you know, some of the more challenging things I'd done in life. That was the whole nature of them. But I felt like it was incredibly rewarding to have the idea of writing the book, 
to see it coming to life, to ride that wave, as you say, that high wave all the way through to the beach and then to have the experience of holding it in my hand and and being at the book launch. Well, before we leave your book, I think you should also talk about how it was putting the beautiful images that you put into the book, because that's a big part of your book. I got to say that was a challenge and it was a challenge technically from the production side. Mm -hmm. I realized that my experience of putting text into a book and then adding images, which were all black and white drawings for the technical manual that I did for my consulting business was so much easier. I really had to realize that my standards, I needed to decide when I was going to be really strong on what I wanted and when I was actually being overly demanding. And I found some of that a bit challenging because my experience of working with designers and then the experience I had with the layout design person that I was working with on my book was just a little confusing at times. It was not what I was expecting. People, I thought, we shared a sort of a similarity of understanding about how to approach certain things. But having done it and having put all my artwork in there, I think it makes the book a much more luscious experience. Mm. And it's partly why I've never released it as an ebook version mm-hmm. because there's much less um, ability to get that side of the book's experience without it. So I feel like that was a huge achievement to get the book I I don't remember exactly the number of images that went in but there was also line drawings and other graphic elements that went into the book and that took quite a bit of time I just want to say if you don't have a copy of the book yet get a copy of this beautiful book well I thank you Jen and we will put the links to our tomes in the show notes for the episode but I want to talk about something now which I think is is the formats that we're going to publish in. And what did you think about? Did you right from the get-go know you were going to do a series of formats or did you just think it was going to be a print version? What was your process around deciding that aspect, Jen? Well, I have to tell you, I had a friend who had painstakingly tried to find a publisher for years and years and years. And I think that did influence me a little bit that I knew I wanted to just self-publish because I wanted to get the book out there and I didn't want it to have a difficulty doing that. So I decided to just go with Kindle. I wanted to have also a book in my hand because I still go out and perform places and I love having that on my Merck table to, to offer to people. And Um, one of my biggest gifts to the world is my voice. And so I decided to go ahead and record them all just to, to have them out there as audio. So I have put them out in those three formats and it's been very satisfying for me. They're little books. I, instead of doing one grand book, like you, I've done little books. They're, they're considered short books. There are 21 lessons or 21 days. The one I'm doing right now is 33. We're growing. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Yes. I've just loved the process and it just has worked for me because it's kind of like the rhythm of how to produce a book now is in me. And so it's easy to do more. So I actually have one that's ready to go to editing and then another one that's just beginning. So it's, it's going to be something that I'm going to continue doing. I love it. I found the publication sort of side of the holding your hand kind of version was definitely big enough for me at the time. And I was, I've really been keen to do an audio version of it, partly because I think sometimes when you hear someone speak their story, it has an, another level of energy of connection. Mm-hmm. And when I did do the book, I also had resources. So if you, when you order the book, you get a, you get a bookmark, which is mostly artwork, but has a beautiful roomy poem on it. And then the other side is a reminder that if you go to the website, you can access the recorded meditations that go with every chapter. So you can read the text version of them in the book, but I don't think that's as powerful when you want to do a guided meditation, you want someone to speak into your ears and into your heart. So you can totally give over your attention to that. And so that's why I recorded the meditations, but it had been in my mind that I would do the book. Haven't got there yet. And it's still on the possibility of the to-do list, but it is quite a big undertaking. And it's probably now that I've started to grow a bit of audio editing technique that I might actually revisit that. (laughs) 
So website and resources, did you do any add-ons or you've kind of had your course as a partner? All of my books have been textbooks. You know, they're, they're a central message for an experience of learning. So mm -hmm. yeah, they have been text textbooks and I think they will continue to be that way because I don't see, I don't know. I, I don't want to say I don't see because I can't always see what's ahead. But I don't know if I'll do memoirs of my own. Who knows? That might be somewhere down the road. But yeah. I'm more interested, I think, in getting it, getting the juice out of the vessel, you know, to share. Mm. So, mm. yeah. I know that I had the absolute gift of being asked by you to do your book covers, which actually gave me very little heart palpitations compared to what that might have done normally. I think the um, trusting in the process was contagious there. But when I came to do mine, I couldn't do my own. Mm. Not so surprising. Mm -hmm. And I ended up using 99 designs, which I found to be fantastic. And I got a front cover I absolutely adore. And so I think that, you know, depending on if you, if you have an artist friend that you can give a good brief to and then let them run with it, or if you have no kind of creatives in your circle that you want to reach out and do it commercially you could be really well placed to grab 99 designs and there are other platforms and I know that Fiverr and Upwork and some of those platforms you can search for cover designs and cover designers but I found that absolutely a wonderful experience for what you know all those that you just mentioned are also great sources for having someone format like a word doc that you'd be easily easily be able to put into a Kindle book, you know, to formatting, you know, Amazon has made it so easy for you to do both the Kindle version and the, and the text version with very little tweaking. Mm. Yeah. And we know what an incredible platform the, the likes of Audible are these days. So audio versions really are very well considered as well as the Kindle version. So I think that that's, yeah. that's big. And one of the other elements of writing the book is celebrating its completion and having some form of book launch which was a little grand in my case <laughs> I must admit so if you're it listening was grand it if was you're glorious. listening <laughs> I invited Jennifer over from Los Angeles to join me in Brisbane Australia and we had my book launch at Avid Reader which is an absolutely superb bookstore at mm. West End and I have a very strong and big heart space for that part of Brisbane. West End is part of my home turf. And Avid Reader is such an incredible heart-centered, book-loving business that has endured and expanded and thrived even despite, you know, changes in technology. So Jennifer hosted me and we had an incredible day of it, really, was the it whole was beautiful. shooting match. I think it was almost as good as my wedding day. Like it was, I had, <laughs> I had nearly 80 friends and family and uh, complete strangers turn up to this book launch and be part of the conversation. And and it was just everything I could have hoped it was, for. It was glorious. In fact, the the picture um, on our podcast, yeah, it's a picture that's of Michelle and I that's taken at that launch. And it was just such a beautiful time. I was totally jet lagged and just loved being amongst all of your beautiful friends and colleagues there who were just celebrating uh, you. It was just wonderful. It was a beautiful celebration. Yeah. And you also hosted my last launch yeah. for Empowered online. Prayer. Yeah. Yeah. We fun. did it online and it was, it was great. It was right in the midst of COVID and we figured out how to do it. And it was, it was lovely. I was grateful for your presence and I think it's it's really a good idea to plan something to yes. celebrate your landmarks, you know. It's it's just really important. Yes. It is. And I actually think from an energetic point of view, it's the way that we regain all that energy that we've invested in that big project. It comes back to us multifold. Mm -hmm. And I think that having some kind of celebration, do you need to throw a, a shindig every single time? No, but for something that's quite that significant. And I think that, that the joy even of the online launch and cup of tea and song and prayer that we did for your Empowered Prayer book was just magnificent and, and had a different and other special qualities because it was across the airwaves and we could then loop in a lot of people from lots of different parts of the globe as a result. I agree. I agree. And most of my community is that way. It's all mm. over the globe. Mm. So 
it, that's how I, I'm used to getting together with people, which is wonderful. And it's also wonderful to do it in person. Yeah. Absolutely. So I've got one more heading here that I'd love to talk to you about, and we don't need to make it long, but it is important, which is pricing. How do we go about pricing our works once they have been produced and looking beautiful? We need to come up with a way to get them out there into the world. And we can obviously gift them, but if we choose to ask a price for them, how do we land at that? And what was your process for figuring out that question, Jen? You know, I, my big desire was as many people has wanted to get this book, to get this book. And so I wanted to just be in the middle of the road with the pricing. And so I just checked out other people with the same kind of length of book. It's interesting because if you do audio audible books, they actually price it for you. They won't let you price it. It's a It depends how long the book is. And the promotion part of starting out with a price, the, the cool thing about Kindle is you can start at a price and then change it. So as a promotional price, I think I did really like, oh, something like a dollar to start with just to get it out there. Because when you first come on Amazon, if that's the way you're going to go, you really want to have a lot of activity mm -hmm. and people reviewing it right away. Hit the splash. Because, yep. Yes, as, as much as you can. And then the, the hardback, I just kind of looked at what other people were doing. That was my process. How about you? I got some advice. And the problem that I had was my book was big. It's a big format in terms of its dimensions and its full color. So I decided to do to price it despite the fact that I was doing print on demand, which is an expensive way to do it per item. I could have chosen to do a bulk buy through one of the print houses in China or Asia, and then I would have been able to get the per unit price right down and been able to pass those savings on, which I thought about. But it also means getting storage and just basically storing boxes and boxes of books, which did not appeal to me at all. And so I priced it. And then I also had advice on what the postage nationally and internationally should be. One thing that I learned was don't take on face value what someone you might think should be very knowledgeable would know the story and would know the right price, but I got given the wrong price. And so Initially, I had, I don't know, $17, $18 for international postage. It turns out the postage is more like $35. Mm -hmm. So I sold my book and had the international postage and basically gifted half my book away. So I stopped that. I took international postages. Now you have to basically contact me and I'll find out the individual country cost. Mm -hmm. And I also got the postage for the national was also wrong. So I got bitten a bit because I didn't go around and do my own checking of some of those things. But ultimately, so the book's just under $40 Australian, $39.95. And that's probably a top price point really for most people. Going forward, I think too, we really have to consider what it would be like, because I know right now the US supposedly doesn't even have first class mail to Australia, which is really crazy. But just thinking about the international markets, how would you do an art book? that wouldn't need to travel via mail? Um, that's a great question. I, it, I don't know the answer. No. And when I've bought specific art books, they've taken three months and they've cost me a hundred bucks. You know, if they're a big heavy tome and they're from overseas, I just have to wait and I have to pay. So I think, you know, that's okay if you're getting some beautiful full color book on George O'Keefe's artwork that's okay. But I think for little old Michelle Walker, that's probably not <laughs> what's going to happen. And so I've, I'm okay with that. And I think it's been really good because most of my circle, like I do have international friends who've been interested, but most of my circle are Australia based. And so when people have found me in networking and reach out and, and purchase one, then it works out to be about $50, $55 Australian with postage included and it gets it gets there. So yeah, pricing, pricing was a bit of a thing and it was it's important. And I think once I realized I was playing in a whole realm where I was actually competing against people who just had 120 pages of pure text, black and white in inside and a color cover, that I was never going to compete on a dollar basis for that. It just wasn't going to happen. It makes sense. Yeah. yeah. 
I think one of the things I love about this conversation is it's part of a bigger topic that I know you and I are interested in, which is how do we how do we share what we've learned and how do we do that through different formats? And one of the possible sister topics to the writing one is how have we captured what we've learned and turned it into online courses for people to be able to engage in that way? And you've already mentioned that your books are actually companion texts for your online courses. And I think that's also another really critical way when we're in the creative realm and part of our desire is to create and then to also share and share learnings. And I think that that might be something we might want to follow up, but we've Mm -hmm. explored the power of our words and what a powerful thing that has been. I mean, for me personally, it physically changed my artwork because I include now, since I wrote my book, I include little handwritten bits of text as a texture in my paintings. Now, I was doing it for a while before I realized there's actually a term for it. It's called asemic, A-S-E-M-I-C, asemic writing. And that's where you're basically using fonts as, in my my case, it was handwritten font, as a component of your design in your Mm. painting. But I thought, yeah, it just started appearing. And then I thought, of course, because now my field of creativity includes being an author. I love that, you know, and I love that you wrote by hand Mother Mary's conclusion for Empowered Prayer underneath the painting, a beautiful painting that you did for the front cover. It's just, it's, I tell everyone about that story because to me, it's not just a painting. It is a living transmission of the words, the images, and you captured it because I said to you, I want the painting to embody this conclusion. And I gave you the conclusion and you wrote it on the canvas before you start painting. And I just think it's so cool. Talk about embodiment. That's the definition of embodiment. (laughs) Yes, it is. What a great thing. Well, thank you. I loved talking to you about our writing journey, Jen, and being able to express how we've shared our life experiences through this medium called book writing. Any other thoughts before we finish off today? I just thank you, Michelle. I loved talking about this with you too. And I think I just want to say as we go on our journey of being artists, it's amazing how your artistry just cannot stay in a box. It just continues to grow with you. So yeah, keep on beloveds. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Let it in, let it flow and it will happen. So thank you everyone for joining us for this episode. And I think it's going to be a bit of a long one. I can already get that sense. Thank you for hanging in here and you'll find all the links for the resources that we've spoken about today will be in the show notes. Wishing you a wonderful week, Jen. Wishing everyone a wonderful week. Yes. Bye for now. And just a special for our listeners of Paintbrush and Ivories, I wanted to let you know that if you would like to purchase a copy of my book, 20,000 Brushstrokes, Inspiring Lessons for Joyful Living Beyond Heartbreak, Loss and Discontent, it sells for $39.95 Australian and has postage added onto it. If you would like to jump onto the website 20,000brushstrokes.com and if you use the coupon Paintbrush and Ivories, all one word, all lowercase, it will take off $15 at the shopping cart checkout. So for our Australian listeners, that's removing the postage and if you're overseas then that will cover part of the postage and I just want to share that with you as a thank you for being our listeners.